Thank you very much, Bill, for that very gracious introduction. Thank you, Chuck, and thank all of you who made this evening possible. Being of Scottish descent, I particularly enjoyed having a free meal. I, I, tr I trust your meal wasn't free, but mine was. And Bill said at the table that he had once considered going into politics, but he was more interested in promoting ideas than getting out and running for office. He figured he'd last longer as a publisher and as an idea missionary. And, but he did learn a little bit of diplomacy. You could tell that in his introduction. He kind of glided over as to how I achieved my position at Forbes magazine. <laughs> you might say, it is true that I came to the attention of top management at a fairly young age. <laughs> uh, or, or, or as my father liked to say, there is nothing wrong with nepotism as long as you keep it within the family. <laughs> uh, as, as a matter of fact, a few weeks after I ended my presidential bid, the commencement season began, and one of the universities in our neck of the woods awarded an honorary degree to Yogi Berra. Asked him to give the commencement speech, and he gave his usual words of advice, such as if you come to a fork in the road, take it, and helpful, helpful things like that. And the newspapers were recounting the numerous Yogi Berra stories, and one of them was that one day, during when he was playing baseball, a reporter told him that the good Catholic voters of Dublin, Ireland, had just elected a Jewish mayor. And Yogi Berra said, gee, that's wonderful. Only in America could that happen. <laughs> and you, you, you might, you, you might say in a sense, you might say in a sense, only in America would somebody spend his own money to run for president to achieve his real ambition, which was to host Saturday Night Live. <laughs> <laughs> but it is fun to be here, especially among people who I think see the world the way all of us do. Because as Bill touched on and Chuck touched on, Ideas are lenses through which we see the world. They do shape how policies are made. And if we don't win the war of ideas, we can elect all the good candidates we want, but they're not going to ultimately make a very much of a long-term difference. And Bill diplomatically hinted at it, of what happened in this last campaign. On the surface, it was a reaffirmation of the status quo. Democrats kept the White House. Republicans kept the Congress. But it really wasn't satisfaction with the status quo, so much as it was that neither party presented a compelling national agenda. So people pretty much stuck with what they knew. And this is kind of too bad, because the temptation will be, as a result of the tone of that campaign in the next couple of years, to kind of incremental, do incremental reforms, move along, get along, not, ro not stir up things too much, Mr. Clinton may get in trouble because of the investigations. He may get in trouble because of a foreign policy crisis. But the mood in Washington now is don't go for big initiatives. And so the danger is that our friends in Congress will come up with ideas such as passing a law, banning old magazines and doctor's offices, or giving tax credits to kids if they clean their rooms once or twice a week, kind of stuff like that because it is too bad. Because right now, America has an extraordinary opportunity. Never before have there been so many glittering opportunities for this country. Never before has a nation been in the position that we occupy today. We're told that we're the only superpower in the world, and for the moment, that's true. But our real strength derives not from the size of our economy, not from the extraordinary capabilities of our people in the military, but our ultimate strength comes from the example we set to ourselves and to the world of what a free people can accomplish and achieve in changing times and circumstances. In short, if America gets it right, the rest of the world has a chance to get it right. But if America gets in trouble, the rest of the world is in trouble. And so America has the potential today for the greatest economic boom and spiritual renewal in our history. And the question before us is, will we realize these glittering opportunities, or will history look back and say, that was an era of missed opportunities? 
Two events have happened in recent years that make possible this extraordinary era that lies before us, the possibilities of it. One is one that we're all familiar with, but I'm not sure we always recognize the importance of, and that is the end of the Cold War. To see the importance of that, just ask yourself a very simple question. How was it that the United States of America, the most anti-government, anti-status, pro-individual nation ever invented, come to have government the size and scope that we have today? How did it come to pass in this century? And the answer is, I think the origins, the wellspring is, the wars that we've had to fight in this century. As you know from your history books, when you face a major threat, face a major enemy, you have a strong center to mobilize the resources of society to meet that threat. And if you look back at the last 80 years or so, you quickly recognize that except for brief periods, America has faced a major external threat of one sort or another. We had two world wars, the economic warfare of the Great Depression, a 40-year Cold War. Now, obviously, the Cold War was different from a hot war, but it did fundamentally change, alter, impact the political, social, and economic life in America. For example, look at federal aid to education. You know what its justification was initially? National security. Federal aid for research and development. National security. Even the interstate highway program begun by Ike in the mid-1950s. None of you here tonight are old enough to remember the mid-1950s. How's that for pandering? <laughs> but but even, even, even the federal highway program had as one of its justifications national defense. When John Kennedy talked about getting America moving again in the early 1960s, proposed those tax cuts, one of his chief justifications was that we had to show the world that we were more dynamic, that we could grow faster than the Soviet Union. So by the early 1960s, a lot of people said, gee, if government could help us win two world wars, help alleviate the distress of the Great Depression, put a man on the moon, be in the forefront of the civil rights movement, why couldn't government solve all of our other problems? Hence, the war on poverty. Hence, a, gener a de decade later, Jimmy Carter's moral equivalent of war for the energy crisis. And so we got a whole array of regulatory and social programs. And this, well, 30 years later, we've learned some very painful lessons. That while there's some things that government must do, there are one heck of a lot of things that government should not and cannot do, and despite all the good intentions, ends up doing far more harm than good. So we have this period of time that won't last forever. We are the superpower of the world. We face a dangerous world, and it's going to get more dangerous if this presidency continues its drift and dithering in foreign policy. But for the moment, we don't face a major threat to our very existence as a free people. Then there's another event that is happening. Many of you are involved in it on a day-to-day -day basis. Whether you call it the information age, the microchip age, the computer age, whatever name you want to give to it, we are entering an era that will alter and is altering the way we live and the way we work. The chip is extending the reach of the human brain the way machines extended the reach of human muscle in the industrial age. Just as, for example, you learn to drive a tractor, you can do more physical labor in a day with that machine than a hundred Herculean plowmen could do in a month in days of old, so too in this new era, we're opening up vistas that are absolutely mind-boggling and would have been inconceivable in ages past. And this new era need not leave anyone behind. One of the virtues of a free society with free people, with free enterprise, is that you succeed most when you provide a product and service that people find simple and easy to use. For example, you don't have to be an engineer to drive and buy an automobile. You don't have to know anything about architecture or be a carpenter to buy and live in a house. You don't have to know anything about aerodynamics to buy an airplane ticket and travel around. So too, in this new era, you won't have to know anything about MIPS or BIPS or LIPS or whatever high-tech jargon is floating around there to participate in this new era. Just look at the early fruits of it. Take something today we take for granted. We don't think of anything of it anymore. The calculator. The calculator is now so cheap that the packaging costs more than the gizmo itself. Everyone has one, easy to learn to use. And thus, in a sense, all of us now, in a sense, are math geniuses. Even if you flunked arithmetic in school, you can now do, in a matter of seconds or minutes, 
the kind of mathematical computations that would have taken math whizzes hours or days to do 40 or 50 years ago. All of us can now do it. We don't think anything of it. And other people sometimes fear that people will be left behind in the labor force in this new era, that if you somehow are not a programmer, you're going to be left behind. Not true. Not true at all. All you have to do is go to a supermarket. I guarantee you, presidential and ex-presidential candidates too, make it a point to visit supermarkets once in a while. And what do you find? What do you find when you go to the checkout counter in the supermarket? Very sophisticated inventory equipment that is changing the face of retailing in America and around the world, but anyone can learn to use it. Wands, lasers, and the like, anyone can learn to use it. So this new era shouldn't leave anyone behind. Everyone should be able to participate in it. We're at, you might say, the Model T stage of this new era, new economic era. Those of you who know your automotive history know that 80 years ago, when you try to start a car, you had to crank the thing. Half the time, you risk breaking your arm. I'll step on some toes, but I've had my free dinner. But in those days, in those days, fortunately, we didn't have many trial lawyers around, so the industry was allowed to learn and move ahead. <laughs> and And so today, assuming the weather's not too bad, you can get into this incredibly complicated piece of machinery, thousands of parts, many microchips. You just turn the key and the blasted thing starts. So too in this new era, it won't be too many years before you have voice-activated computers. You're put off by the keyboard not to worry. You'll be able to program it so that if you say nasty things to it, it won't say nasty things back. That if you say politically incorrect things to it, you can program it so it won't drag you to court. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to improve the quality of life. You know, you raise small kids. At the end of the day, you're bedraggled, you want to talk to a real adult. At the end of the day, a real adult doesn't want to talk. A real adults had a hard day, too. So you kind of have two grumps. Not to worry anymore with this new era. With your flat screen, three-dimensional computer, You'll be able to talk to somebody, 12-hour time zone difference, another part of the world. They haven't been uh, bedraggled yet. So you, you'll be able to talk to real adults, even if you have small kids around. So you have enormous improvement in the quality of life. And it's just, just beginning. And the implications of it are profoundly pro-American. The machine age, the dynamic of the machine age was bigness. Big companies, big cities, big unions, big government. Today, if you have a big company, you almost have to apologize for it. You almost have to explain that your size won't get in the way of being flexible, won't stand in the way of taking advantages of fast-changing opportunities that might come up. You almost have to apologize for size today. It's back to American individualism. It's anti-authoritarian, anti-hierarchical, almost Jeffersonian in its dynamic. So this new era is ready-made for America, ready-made for America. And this new era will make us realize something that's always been true, <clears throat> but something that we've tended to overlook in times past. In times past, we've tended to think of wealth as material things, land, armies, piles of jewels, and in days of old, slaves. But the real source of human wealth, the real source of human capital, is the human mind, imagination, innovation, the human spirit, the soul. That's the real source of wealth in a society. You have knowledge, you have a society with rules, a sense of right and wrong, and extraordinary things can happen even if you suffer physical setbacks. That's the real source of wealth, and that's the extraordinary miracle of the microchip. You go through customs today with a bag of jewelry, you'll pay a heavy duty. You go through customs with a piece of plastic that could be worth billions of dollars because of the programming on it, pennies, not to worry, go right through. No duty at all. That's the real source of wealth. And it's ready-made for America. So we are on the cusp of an extraordinary new era. You take something, you just take something like oil. We tend to think of oil as a natural resource. There's nothing natural about it. Oil in and of itself, what is it? Glop. You can't eat it. You can't feed it to camels. It's human innovation that made that glop natural that made it something of value. Human imagination, human inventiveness. So this, of course, gets to a very basic question. Why aren't we doing better as a nation? Why aren't we having great thrusts of growth? 
why are we now supposed to be content with two or two and a half percent real growth rates? After all, the fundamentals are there for an enormous advance. I mentioned Cold War is over. A very pro-American era is coming, its characteristics. We've had an investment boom since the early 80s with only brief interruptions. We're now the foremost manufacturing nation in the world again. We've pulled ahead of Germany, pulled ahead of Japan. Just look at the auto industry. Six years ago, Chrysler was on the financial ropes. Didn't know whether the company was going to make it. Last year, Chrysler alone made more money than the entire Japanese auto industry put together. And in high technology, whether it's microprocessors, software, fiber optics, fiber optics, internet technology, America is leading the world. So why aren't we doing better? What is standing in the way? And here we get to the obstacles. They're no secret. You've been talking about them for years and years. Obstacles include regulatory excess. Washington has learned something, and so have some state capitals. They know the American people are in no mood for big increases in spending. They know the American people are in no mood for higher taxes. So they've discovered rules, regulations, and mandates. They can tell you what to do. It doesn't cost much to print a new regulation in the Federal Register, but it can be very, very costly. Very costly. And the regulations come kind of, become kind of silly. We have a story in the next issue of the magazine about mandates. One example, a couple has a couple of restaurants. OSHA comes in and says, you must give your people sophisticated training on handling hazardous chemicals. Now, why do they have to spend all that money in paperwork training on handling hazardous chemicals? Because the restaurant uses bleach. So they fall into the trap. A couple of years ago, a bank in Kansas was fined by the regulators. What was the crime of this bank? Most of you have experienced drive-through banking. When you they with this bank, their ATM machine for drive-through banking didn't have Braille on it. Now, why would you want Braille on a machine for drive-through banking? I mean, <laughs> is, is there something missing here? <laughs> you see it too. You see it too in communications. Most of you have had experiences on the internet and the web. And you notice the graphics are very primitive. It takes forever to get the thing up. If you have moving people, they almost look like those old Charlie Chaplin movies, the jerky quality. That's not a lack of technology. It's regulation. The regulators won't let the cablers and the telcos, telephone companies, put a single wire into your home, unite and put a single wire into your home. Telephone wires can only handle thousands of bits of information. Cable wire can handle millions of bits of information. So as a result, we have to go through the contortions of big modems and try to do it through compression. It could be done very easily. It would be as if you had a modern-day automobile. You have a highway, but you're not allowed to drive on the highway. You have to stay on a cow path. It's ridiculous. We need education reform. We know that our education system is not giving people the education that they deserve, the education they need. And it's not that the kids today are dumber or more obtuse or they come from backgrounds that make them uneducatable. Absolute hogwash. It's the schools that aren't responding to the needs of the time. It's the schools that respond. Just look at the textbooks that we use today and compare the vocabulary, compare the verbiage to what you had in textbooks 40 or 50 years ago. We're dumbing down our kids. We're dumbing them down. We're doing that, not the kids. Can inner city kids be educated? Of course. Private schools, parochial schools have shown that they can be educated. In New York City, the cardinal there was so horrified by what the schools were doing, and yet they said, well, that's because the parochial schools and non-public schools cream off the best kids. So the cardinal there, O'Connor, offered a deal. He said, I'll take your thousand worst students. Give me your thousand worst students and see what we can do. The business community responded and said, we'll provide the money for these kids so you don't get caught up in constitutional issues. The bureaucracy is dragging its feet. And just today, yesterday it was released, it was in today's paper, they finally looked at the budget, $8.8 .8 billion education budget in New York City, $8,800 per student, and they discovered that only 40 cents on the dollar was going for classroom instruction. So you know why that bureaucracy is dragging its feet. 
The parochial schools, a few years ago, they finally did some counting. The parochial schools in New York have a central office for education consisting of 35 people. New York City, 7,000. That has got to change. You do it through charter schools, better do it through choice. Make the schools accountable to the parents and the kids will start to get educated again. Whenever you have a monopoly that's not accountable, the monopoly becomes self-interested and not interested in its ultimate customer. We need legal reform, so we have a system where if you write something, it means something. We need monetary reform. But as Bill indicated, hinted, there's a subject that I will reluctantly talk about, <laughs> and that is taxes. It's nighttime, I know, but there's always a good time to discuss this horrible subject. <laughs> And if you just understand one thing about taxes, you will be ahead of most economists and most policymakers in Washington. And it's simply this. Taxes are not just a means of collecting revenue for the government. Taxes are also a price and a burden. The tax you pay on income, profit, capital gains is the price you pay for working, the price you pay for being productive, innovative, successful, willing to take risks and provide a foundation for the future. And the proposition is very simple. If you lower the price and burden on those good things, you get more of them. If you raise the price and burden on those good things, you get less of them. Every time we reduce the burden on the American people, the American people have responded with energy, imagination, innovation. We've moved ahead. Incomes have gone up, better paying jobs were created, the standard of living improved, and government revenues went up as well. What Washington fears is not a loss of revenues from changing and junking the tax code. What they really fear is a loss of power. The tax code today is the biggest source of political power in Washington, the biggest source of political corruption and pollution in Washington. They do trade. They do trade favors and loopholes for contributions and support. And the system has gone on long enough. Not only is the price too high, <laughs> not only is the price too high, the tax code today, on those good things we talked about, but it also, nobody understands what's in the tax code anymore. Not even the IRS understands what's in the tax code anymore. You give your tax return to 10 different tax preparers and you'll get 10 different returns. It's an atrocity. Just to put it in perspective, Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address ran a little over 200 words to find the American nation. America's Declaration of Independence, 1,300 words. The Holy Bible, which took a few years to put together, 773,000 words. The Federal Income Tax Code and its intended regulations, seven and a half million words and rising. And nobody knows what's in there anymore. And it, it, it has a corrosive, acidic effect on civil society. If you don't have faith in the tax code, don't be surprised that people start to lose their moorings in other areas as well. And just to put it, just to give you one example of how much it's gotten out of hand, you all have your horror stories. I read one in the other day, paper, true story about a California couple they had to file a petition in tax court. So their lawyer calls up the IRS office and says, when is the petition due? The office answered, March 14th. They call another IRS office, just to be sure. The petition is due March 14th. March 14th rolls around, the couple files the petition. They get a notice in the mail a few days later. The notice says, your petition is being rejected without a hearing because the real deadline date was March 13th. A couple didn't think that was fair, so they went to court. And just recently, a federal court ruled that under current law, the IRS cannot be held responsible for giving you false and misleading information. You're on your own. And if you want to know, talk about quality of life in America, you ever asked why do two incomes in a family not seem to be able to do the job that one income could in previous generations? Just look at your tax bill today. Typical family in America today pays eight times as much tax on each dollar of income as a typical family did 45 years ago. Just the other day, I was on an airplane, been on a lot of them recently, 
I sat next to a machinist who worked for one of the major airlines. He's hitching a ride, going from one facility to another. It was the end of the day, so I let him do the talking. I'd done my preaching for the day. And he told me he's married, they have three kids. He said they have trouble making ends meet. He said, on paper, we're doing very well. He said, as a machinist, I get a very good wage, but it's not enough. I have to work part time. My wife has to work as well, not out of choice, but out of necessity. And he said, we're starting to worry we're not spending enough time with our young children. And he said, I finally figured it out. He was telling me this. He said, I finally figured it out it was those taxes. He used a four-letter word before him. But he said, if you add up, if you add up what you pay in federal income tax, federal payroll tax, state income tax, sales taxes, property taxes, gasoline taxes, excise taxes, you stay at a hotel, you pay an occupancy tax or two, you want to get married, you pay a fee. You want to drive, you pay a fee. You have an automobile or truck, you pay a fee. You have a pet, you pay a fee. It's not just what they take out of your paycheck. Everything you do, the government takes a cut of. So he figured their income, over half of it, went to fees and taxes. And he said, no wonder we're having trouble getting ahead of the curve. And it's not right, and it's not necessary. And we've got to change it. It gets really to a moral issue. It really does, if you think about it, get to the American dream. All of these reforms are simply means to an end. And as you know, the American dream is allowing each of us and all of us the chance to discover and develop to the fullest our God-given talents. Anything that stands in the way of the dream, we must fight. Anything that enhances the dream, we must support. America has never been a feudalistic nation. We've always been a bottoms-up nation. We must recognize and develop that strength again. So with this tax code, there's only one thing to do. You can't reform it. The only thing you can do, scrap is not a strong enough verb. You got to take it, kill it, drive a stake through its heart, bury it, and hope it never rises again. So it is a means to an end. And finally, another obstacle that should be mentioned is obsolete thinking. One of the things you learn on the campaign trail, you learn it very quickly, is that people who spend a lifetime in politics face a very real danger. And that is they see life not as something dynamic, but as a zero-sum game. You win the election or you lose the election. If somebody moves up the ladder, that means somebody's moved down or out. Somebody gains, somebody loses. And you can see this mentality this inability because of their everyday experiences of not being able to appreciate the dynamics of a free economy where everyone has a chance to move ahead. It doesn't have to be medieval zero sum. Everyone can move ahead. You can see it in the whole debate on entitlement reform. In Washington, they think the only thing you can do is raise fees, raise taxes, and find ways to reduce benefits and not suffer the political consequences for it. That's the way they see it. So when they talk about Social Security, the first thing that comes to their mind is, how do we raise the retirement age? How do we change the way they compute the cost of living increases so we save money there? How do we find raises of raising the payroll tax? That's their mentality. There's a different way, simpler way, more dynamic, and that is start a new system for younger people. Keep the current system for those who are on it, and those are going to go on in the next 12 to 15 years because real life decisions have been made on the basis of those promises. But why not start a new system for younger people? They know the current one's going to be in terrible shape in the next century. So why not, while we still have time, start a new system where part of their payroll tax would go not to Washington, but to their own individual savings or retirement account. They would own it, get a monthly, quarterly statement, would be in their hands, not the politicians' hands. They couldn't touch the money until a certain age, pick an age, 59, whatever, but it would be belong to them. The money would be invested in the real American economy. They could choose an array of mutual funds, their choice, CDs, whatever they're comfortable with. If they want to retire at age 59 and a half, the computer can tell them, assume normal returns, how much you're going to have to put in the fund each year, grow tax-free. But that way, it's not the politicians telling you when you retire. If you want to wait till you're 88, fine. 68, fine. Choice is up to you. So that way, we take it out of the hands of Washington. And it can be done. We have time to do it. 
And you take a 20-year-old person today making minimum wage, 10000 a year, and deposit their payroll tax, which is now $1,240, into a retirement account, assume normal investment returns, do that each year. By the time that person reaches age 65, 70, he or she will have a retirement account with over a half a million dollars in it. They'll earn more almost in retirement than they did working. That is what happens when you take it out of the center, take it from they, the bureaucracy, return it to we, the people. The same thing is true in Medicare. You don't have to cut benefits, slash benefits, raise co-pays, deductibles. There's a simpler way, medical savings accounts. I won't bore you with the details tonight, but what it would do is give you control over routine expenses, give you real catastrophic coverage. And if you know anything about Medicare, you know Part A and Part B are, don't, are inadequate. You have to buy Medigap insurance. Medical savings accounts done right gives you better coverage, more control at less cost. We tried a variation of it at Forbes magazine, even without the benefits of a tax code five years ago. Our people today pay less. Our expenses, medical expenses, are less per person than they were five years ago. And not one person is in managed care. The danger is if we keep the current system on Medicare and keep the current trend towards managed care, the danger is we're going to have a situation that is hostile to innovation. As you know, health insurance today is simply prepaying next year's expenses. It's not real insurance. With medical savings accounts done right, we get real catastrophic insurance again. And we have a system that won't be hostile to innovation. As you know, innovation initially is very expensive. Then they get on the so-called learning curve. It becomes cheap, and we think it's the most common thing in the world. No big deal. But if you have a system that is always trying to squeeze every penny now, that is simply prepaying next year's expenses, all you get is a system that will be hostile to innovation and breakthroughs. Remember, the CAT scan was invented in England, had to be developed here in the United States. So there are simpler ways to do it. And finally, just remember, in times of great change, it is very easy for people to lose their moorings, lose their bearings. We've seen it happen before. People lose the sense of a strong sense of right and wrong. And we have breakthroughs coming with the human brain that is going to increase that danger again. Because soon people will be able to say, we know how the human brain now works. They're going to say that it's like a negative, like a picture, a negative on a film. From the time you're born, they're going to say, we're going to know your personality, we're going to know your proclivities. And how the pictures develop may be up to the parents and the environment, but it's pretty much there from birth. They're going to say, this shows the soul doesn't exist. They're going to say that free will really doesn't exist. It's hogwash. But those are the dangers with great breakthroughs. So if we keep our bearings, we have an extraordinary era ahead. I think we will do things more right than wrong. And I'm convinced, as I think you are, that when historians look back on this era, they're going to have to conclude once again that the American people will have proven wrong, the critics, the skeptics, the crep hangers, the negativists, and the doubters. And they're going to have to conclude once again that the American nation will have resumed her place, her rightful place, as the leader and inspiration of the world. Thank you very much. question is, am I running in 2000? I'll answer that diplomatically. That is, I haven't uh, made a decision yet because we don't know what's going to be happening in the year 2000. I will be staying involved. I'll be launching an organization next year called Americans for Hope, Growth, and Opportunity to promote these pro-growth issues. But I've learned, even in my own brief political career, how swiftly things can change. I'll give you one example. Last August, a week before the Demo Republican Convention, one week before the formal opening of the Republican Convention in San Diego, Jack Kemp and I were on Larry King Live to discuss the tax cut proposal that Dole had just unveiled in Chicago that day. And Jack was saying he was wondering whether it would be worth his while to go out to the Republican Convention in San Diego. As you may recall, he had endorsed me just before I ended my campaign. So the Republican establishment was teed off at him. They wouldn't return his phone calls. They told him he'd have no speaking role at the convention. And he's wondering whether it was, why bother to go out there? 48 hours later, he gets the call, come to Russell, Kansas, you've been anointed. So things can change very, very quickly.
but I will stay involved one way or the other. The, the question is, uh, if I had won the primaries, won the nomination, would I have waged a real campaign? I think the answer is obvious. Yes, the only way you could win the primaries is with a campaign and a message. And one of the things you learn, you learn a couple of things. First, you do learn, it's a humbling experience to realize it firsthand, you are not always in control of events. Now, you may remember that letter that Lincoln wrote, poignant letter in the Civil War, where he said, quite frankly, events have controlled me more than I've controlled events. And that was humility on his part. But on the campaign trail, you recognize you're not always in control of your destiny. And there are numerous examples of it. But also, too, you learn that if you have a message and stick to it, the message does get through despite all the noise distractions. The reaction on the part of my friends in the media to the flat tax was uniformly, almost uniformly skeptical and negative. And the attacks from the other side, my opponents, were very harsh. They said the flat tax would be the end of the world, it would destroy your house, destroy universities, destroy the country. If you had hair, you'd lose it. If you had dog, it would get fleas, uh, plagues, earthquakes, everything else was going to happen. And you might say, even though the messenger got mussed up a little bit in those contests, the message did get through. The exit poll showed that most people still favored the concept. So that's, that, to me, is a campaign, having an agenda. And going back to Greece, you know, the word rhetoric comes from the Athenian democracy. For all of its flaws, it meant to persuade. What we have to do is learn the arts of persuasion. But you have to have something that you think people need to be persuaded about. And uh, I think we do. So that's the past. Got to look to the future. And that's what I think we've got to do. We have time for one more. Uh, the question is, why do I think the Dole campaign didn't succeed? I think that uh, Bill put it very well in his introduction. I think we had a good agenda. But unfortunately, particularly in our paid media, we never explained what that agenda was. We never explained what the tax cut was. We never explained that it was a down payment for an overhaul of the tax code, a bridge, if you will, to tax simplification. Clinton loved that bridge metaphor. He, he, never, he never mentioned that his was a toll bridge to the future. But uh, <laughs> And you could see it. You see, the American people have had so many broken promises that if you make, start to talk about something like tax cuts, initial reaction is, oh, yeah, we've heard that before. They're just throwing stuff out at us. And as a result, at the end of the campaign, because we didn't stick to message and didn't explain it the way it should have been explained, especially in our paid media, a poll was taken and found that 40% of the voters thought that Dole would increase taxes. 19% thought it was more likely he would cut taxes. We didn't get the message through. But if you get it through, as John Engler showed in Michigan, Christy Whitman showed it in New Jersey in 93, I had a vested interest in that campaign. She ran against an incumbent governor. We devised a tax cut package for her. When she introduced it in September, her negative ratings went up, and the gap between her and her opponent increased. It was already double digits, and it got worse, because people's initial reaction was campaign gimmick. But she stuck to it. She came from 20 points behind to win the election. After the election, her opponent, the incumbent governor, was asked, how did you lose a 20-point lead? He said it happened in the last two weeks of the campaign. He said it wasn't so much that people believed in the particulars of her plan as they began to believe that she believed in the plan. And that's the key. That's the key. Stay on mess. Have a message. Have a good message. And then hammer it home. And with your help, we'll do it next time. We'll get it home. Thank you very much. Thank you.